Hi, my name's Martin Briley. I'm one of the founders at Candy Space and senior partner. And today I'm happy to have with me Adam Davey, who's our director of technology. He's going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit, Adam, about um, what companies, brands should do when they're considering a replatform. Mm. So, shoot, what yes. are the things they should consider? What should the director of IT, the board, mm. what should they be considering when they're making that big decision? Because it is a big decision. It's, it's an expensive one and it's a timely one. Yep. So for businesses, it's, it takes a lot of consideration. It's a big decision and it's a decision that often takes time. Um, and that's for good reason. Um, I think it's essential that if, you know, if, if a business is going to go on this journey, a replatform journey, that they, they consider all of the eventualities, they gather all the requirements, functionals, non-functionals, they look at their tech ecosystem in detail, they look at their tech debt, um, they make sure their technology strategy is aligned with where they're going and all of the stakeholders are on that journey too. Um, you know, looking at where they want to be from a performance perspective, making sure they look at the security and the compliance of the new platform, um, looking, making sure their API design and how data is going to be managed. All of those things are really key. And, you know, ultimately conducting an in-depth discovery phase, bringing in all of the stakeholders is, is, is going to get you to a better place. I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's a very considered decision that takes a lot of time and requires a lot of detail. So you said it takes a lot of time, not only the decision making, but then the transition over to the new platform. Mm -hmm. Businesses, particularly now with being so cost, cost concerned, mm. will be worried about how rapidly they can deploy, how easy it's going to be to transition over and what cost it's going to be. So how, yeah. how can we help businesses marry that, that concern about cost and pace with the business need? I mean, that goes back to very, very clearly defining the needs of the business, the needs of the customers, building out those requirements, functional and non-functional, and actually put, putting a roadmap based on estimations that are accurate, um, and, and uh, working with the stakeholders to really come up with a, a kind of a, a plan for execution. Um, ultimately, they all need to be brought in on the journey. So, so, so when a business comes to Candy Space, and talks about a business transformation of that type and replatforming. Mm. What are we going to do? We're going to because they want to know how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost. Yeah, is that the best way to work? Um, you start you start by thinking about what the needs of the business are. You, you think about um, outcomes rather than what solution am I going to build. So, what what are you trying to drive? Are you trying to drive more engagement? Are you trying to sell more goods online? Um, are you try to book, get people to book test drives on your um, automotive site. It's all about delivering upon those outcomes rather than on the services or the features of the platform. All of those things ladder down from the outcomes you're seeking to drive. So that's about kind of, again, laddering those into requirements, which are specific deliverables that can then be roadmapped. But um, keeping everybody focused on why are we doing this? Because as I say, it's a, a huge undertaking mm. and everyone should be laser focused on exactly why we're doing it and what outcomes we're seeking to drive from the endeavor. So one of the, the critical decisions is which platform to go with. Yeah. Um, you know, contemporary platform solutions are many mm. and trying to find the right one for your business is yep. going to be again, absolutely critical. So talk a little about the process of discovery for the business and then also throw into that mix why I might consider the super trendy headless solution. Yeah. What is it about the Mac architecture that might appeal? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, we, we, we like to run discovery phases so that everyone is aligned. So during that, we, we will sit down and get a super, super clear idea of what it is we're trying to achieve, um, you know, business requirements, user requirements. Um, that might be building out wireframes, proof of concepts, doing some spikes. Um, at the end of the day, and also getting a close understanding of what the kind of target architecture will be. We take people on a journey, we are agnostic about technology, we work with a wide range of different technologies, but at the end of the day, we aren't pushing one technology for, for no reason. We, we have a range and we work with that range because all of those technologies have fulfill a purpose and for, fulfill a purpose for our clients too. Um, you know, be that headless. Headless is, again, I would say something of a buzzword at the moment, but for good reason. Headless actually in many ways frees people up to compose solutions based on best in breed. 
So that can be, you know, uh, a CMS, um, a, a CDP, uh, that can be, um, you know, a nice clean React front end that sits on top of it, but headless frees up businesses to compose solutions that are more nimble, more agile. They don't necessarily solve the problem of complexity. They shift the problem of complexity somewhere else, mm. but it is a more nimble and agile way of building out a stack that more closely aligns with the needs of a business as you know in a more agile fashion and then so added to that equation would flexibility be one of the appealing points of a headless solution yeah flexibility and agility because you know the, the whole point of leveraging a SaaS platform um, allows you to pick something that does its job better than anything else in the market and, and, and put it alongside and integrate it with something else that also does a job as per the spec. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that gives you great flexibility, but that the, the complexity there is those two things need to be integrated. We also work with DXPs, where lots of that integration is managed within natively on the platform. So I would say it's a different decision. Um, and, you know, DXPs have their, like Optimize, they have a whole range of advantages as well, cutting edge um, solutions like that, that are ultimately a Swiss army knife of capabilities um, and, and can be arranged headlessly as well. Lots of the way, the way Opti's going at the moment is mm. very much in that direction. So in short, what, what would be the three key considerations or words of advice that you would give to tech leaders when it comes to evaluating your, your future transformation? Um, get buy-in from stakeholders. Don't underestimate existing complexity and uh, don't overlook data that may have to be migrated and integrated into your stack. Because th th you know, those are the things that end up chewing into a lot of time and require a lot of heavy lifting. So yeah, but re really it's about bringing people along with you on that journey your stakeholders should be your allies throughout something like a rebuild. So that's, that's interesting, the point about data. So then what you have to consider is not just the, the front end customer experience, yep. but the full stack. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that and the complexities around um, back end integrations. Yeah, I mean, lots of these platforms have uh, custom connectors or marketplaces that are kind of facilitate integration with well known platforms that that can give you a super massive head start. Um, as soon as you get into the world of building out customized integrations and middleware, um, you, it, that is a different endeavor. You need to just be mindful that that is, you know, building and maintaining another piece of software in your stack. But very often businesses require that. Not all businesses have the same requirements. So it's ultimately, it all comes back to, you know, what's available out mm -hmm. the box, what can be customized, what connectors are available, what can be, what, what is out there on the marketplace and what we can just leverage to get going. Um, the other thing is people often, when it comes to replatforming, you have to often replace existing functionality. There may be quicker wins to do that. So an MVP, um, it's very difficult to persuade people to go to market with less than what they currently have. So there may be quicker routes to getting to that place, but mm. ultimately that, that compromises the MVP. And so then that leads on to what are the, the most common mistakes made by businesses committed to transformation, but mm. doing it in not necessarily the, the best way. Yeah, I think it, um, common mistakes are not getting buy-in from all stakeholders, not looking at the stack and what needs to be kept or thrown away, uh, not looking at data and integrations and what custom code might need to be written. And also, on, uh, let's not forget, there are a couple of different people in the mix that often do get forgotten people who are going to be using these systems day to day, be that marketing people. People often forget about those people that have to edit, maintain and update content. Mm -hmm. And poor developers, the DX, the developer experience is ultimately key. These are the people that are going to be building out your platform and delivering the next generation of customer experience. They need to be happy with the tools they're working with. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's interesting what you're saying. And I'm, I'm interested what happens beyond the moment of decision where actually you've committed to the new platform and perhaps you've bought a DXP like Optimizely, mm -hmm. it's expensive, you know, there's no two ways about it, it's an expensive subscription model, yep. but it carries huge value. And what are some of the ways that business that you've seen businesses react, work with mm. a, a DXP? That's an interesting point. By, by just buying a DXP, it doesn't move you through that maturity curve. 
you have to take the steps to move through that maturity curve and that means transforming the way your businesses use that platform. Um, we often see uh, companies buy uh, products like Opti, um, which are fully fledged uh, capable solutions with lots and lots of different capabilities and features, all of which integrate with each other. And we often see them not getting the full advantage of those, those complex systems. Um, we would uh, often, the way we do it is advise to go take baby steps on your journey. So look at doing things like visitor groups, you know, um, segmenting customers based on where they are, um, what pages they visited before, serving them content based on previous experiences. Um, that's, uh, you know, and, and, you know, doing things like content recommendations, recommending content that, that people want to see um, based on where the, what they've looked at before. Um, look, you know, integrating things like the, like the Optimizely data platform, which is a really strong, all-encompassing platform that harnesses all of your data together and allows you to get a single customer view. That is a further step along that maturity curve, but that's one that we've, we've taken with customers before. And then bringing things like, you know, using the digital asset management um, to manage all your, your, your media and your library. All of those things are just steps that we would take bit by bit to get to where we need. So, you know, um, it, it's not something that happens overnight, but it's something we can plan and manage with our clients. And, and we're used to taking them on that journey. Adam, that's been hugely helpful. Very interesting. I hope you've all enjoyed it out there. Thank you. Adam, thank you for watching. Thank you.